Given the history of titles covered by Comic Book Breakdown up to this point, this might be a bit of a surprise to some listeners, but Marvel Comics is not my favorite comic book company of all time. Nor is their longtime rival DC, although I must admit that they've got some titles that have just been knocking it out of the park for me lately. I have managed to find a variety of titles that I like at other companies like Image, Cliffhanger, Boom Studios, and Wildstorm, but none of them have managed to win my heart with any sense of regularity. It's always these sporadic bursts of on and off. Marvel is definitely my main comic home. I love Marvel. I will always return to it. I honestly do. But they're not my favorite company of all time. No. My favorite comic book company is CrossGen Comics! Now, CrossGen hasn't operated since 2004, so you might think that I'm insane. There might be a strong chance that you, dear listener, have not heard of them up to this point. That is a damn shame, and I aim to rectify it. I've already covered one of CrossGen's titles here on the show, the high-tech medieval comic Scion, which saw young Prince Ethan of the Heron dynasty gifted with a strange magical glyph called the Sigil. The Sigil allowed Ethan to create a sword from pure energy and accidentally start a war. Accidents happen to everybody, you know, maybe have a little bit of grace and be a little bit more forgiving. Over the course of Scion, Ethan struggled with his responsibility to his family and kingdom, his duty to equality for all sentient beings, which included the genetically designed slave race called the Lesser Races. Ethan regularly fought the enemy Prince Braun, who quickly gained superpowers all of his own and fell in love with Ashley, the enemy princess. But through it all, Ethan did what he thought was right, even if no one else agreed with him. Where the sigil came from, what other parties were interested in it, and what threats loomed in the background of the cross-gen universe, Ethan never got to know. In our next series, we will actually be meeting two sigil bearers. The young, naive, and optimistic Sefi, and her uncle, the cold, calculating, and ruthless Elan. Before we get into the story, though, let's lay down some background details about CrossGen first, and why I loved it so much back in the day, and why I still continue to love it to this day, over 20 years later. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown episode 32.0, a quick history of cross-gen comics. For the longtime readers slash watchers, if you watched Breakdown's coverage of Scion, then you've listened to the majority of this episode before. I have rewritten large parts of it, cutting out, to be quite honest, cutting out some of my personal experience with CrossGen and focusing more on CrossGen's history and more of a documentary style presentation as opposed to my personal experience with CrossGen. Uh, while I wanted to make sure any new listeners were getting kind of the emotional investment that I had in CrossGen and that I still hold sacred with CrossGen, I also wanted to let you folks know that this episode ultimately doesn't present a ton of new information. I would argue that this is about 30 to 40 percent new information and about 60 to 70 percent old information represented. Clearly, I hope you listen. Uh, by no means should you stop. You should never stop. Never stop listening to Breakdown. Listen to Breakdown all the time. Whether you're listening on your podcast or you're listening on YouTube, you can just mute it and leave it running in the background. That's fine. Turn your volume down so you can barely hear me. Just let it run. Just let it run. But that said, I still tried to produce the best episode that I could while representing all of this old material in as fresh and new a light as possible while bringing in new information to make it worth it for you to listen to this episode. I'm walking a real fine line here between doing a rerun and creating something new. I'm not going to lie, but I need the time to try and get the Meridian episode produced. Give me this. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Back in the year 2000, on a trip to Hills, a now-defunct 
department store along the lines of like Target or Walmart, my family were pulling up to the L-shaped shopping center when I noticed a new store in the lineup. One whose exterior sign just read quite simply and beautifully, comics. And honestly, that's all that I need to know. I never learned the actual name of this store, and it is long gone by now, but I will always remember it for the role that it played in my own personal comic book history, largely because of CrossGen, but also because this was the store where I bought my first copy uh, of the first appearance of Gambit, so that's kind of neat. This store was tall, for one thing, just physically. Despite being a one-story building, I was much more used to the smaller, tighter, much more cramped spaces of Comic Book City. And this place felt gigantic in comparison. Comic Book City was also mostly wood, and it had that nice smell of old, worn wood to it. It is a scent that I've come to associate with comics and happiness and peace. The lighting was dark in this new place, and comic boxes ran along both walls of it once you got past the racks that had the new comics. They even had one old-school spinner rack, and it was at this rack that I first encountered CrossGen Comics in person. CrossGen originally launched with five titles. The four monthly ongoing series, Sigil, Mystic, Scion, and Meridian, and I believe they came out in that monthly order, if I recall, and one quarterly series, Cross-Gen Chronicles. And honestly, all of them caught my eye. You see, while I love superhero comics, by the time 2000 came around in my comic buying career, I had already been hungry for comics that were more than just superheroes. I wanted fantasy sword and sorcery stories. I wanted sci-fi space battles and just everything in between those two. I had begun to scratch that itch with comic books like Tailweaver and Battle Chasers and Warlands. I had also been experimenting with manga, which published so many different type of stories that I could pretty much just drown in it if I wanted to. And as much as I do love manga, comics will always be my first entertainment home. It's just something about it clicks with me. I wanted American comic books to do more, and CrossGen as a company set out to do that from the jump. Founded by entrepreneur Mark Alessi, CrossGen Comics was built to save the comic book industry. Like myself, Alessi grew up reading comics, but his time was during the 70s and the 80s. In his day, comics were much more multi-genre, publishing westerns, fantasy, war, romance, horror, and sci-fi stories all alongside the superhero stuff. Those superheroes quickly proved to be the hot properties, though, and slowly, as time went on, the other genres just kind of died out. Comic books seemed to become only about superheroes, depending on yearly crossovers to just make sales in order to survive. No other form of entertainment does that. If you turn on the TV, uh, there are endless genres to watch. You go to a bookstore in a library, same thing, endless genres to read in. Movies, same thing. Manga, very much di same thing. But for comic books, sales were beginning to slow. And they continue to slow even now, as the market began to cater less to the broad attentions of the entertainment-hungry world, and more to the singular... I dare say, obsessive focus of white males aged 13 to, like, 45. Companies originally published superheroes because they sold better than everything else, but nowadays it seems like companies can't afford to publish anything but superheroes, and at the time, the market as a whole suffered for it. Financially stable, thanks to the companies that he had founded before CrossGen in the tech industry, Mark Alessi spoke to comic fans, shop owners, and industry professionals about what the industry was doing wrong, what it was doing right, and what it needed to do in order to grow. Combining those answers with his own love and passion for the industry, Alessi visited his cousin, Gina M. Villa, and pitched her the idea of making his own comic book company. The name, CrossGen, was built on the idea of drawing their success from across generations. In his research, Alessi saw storytelling trends and themes in successful books that had always worked, and he incorporated those ideas into his company. 
Although initially skeptical, Alessi won his cousin over, and the pair quickly conceptualized four titles. These books would all share a single universe, the cross-gen universe. But they would have these connections that ran through them while still standing alone. No one would be forced to buy every book that they published in order to understand what was going on in one of them. There would be no issue-by-issue crossovers here. But, you know, if you liked one comic and then you decided to read another one, and you started to see connections between the two books that were not advertised or imminently well-explained, well, you know, maybe you'd read another book after that, and you would just kind of read everything like I did. These books would also specifically not be about superheroes. Alessi was a fan of the heroic journey, sure, which is perhaps what a superhero comic is in its most boiled-down essence. And Alessi's books would feature people who did have superpowers, but they wouldn't be spandex-clad do-gooders with a hidden identity kind of thing. Alessi understood that superheroes only appealed to a small portion of the media-consuming populace, and he was someone who was looking to appeal to the world. Alessi then began hunting for the talent to make his comics, and his first authorial hires were Ron Mars and Barbara Kessel. Mars had been a part of the comic book industry for years at this point, working for Valiant Comics, Image Comics, Dark Horse, and of course, the big boys Marvel and DC. While I haven't read either of his specific runs myself, I knew him best as the long-running author of DC's Green Lantern and Marvel's Silver Surfer, paired with artist Ron Lim. Barbara Kessel, on the other hand, spent quite a bit of time as an editor, initially at DC, then at Dark Horse, and then she began to write as well during both of those stints. Paired with her husband, they created a Hawk and Dove miniseries, which then turned into an ongoing series for, I think it was like two years? She actually wrote Savant Guard for Wildstorm, teamed with author Kurt Busick for a handful of issues of Stormwatch and Wildcats, and wrote a variety of annuals, one-shots, or special issues for Marvel and DC. I won't lie, when I started reading CrossGen, I had never heard of Barbara Kessel. But I certainly know about her now. Working with Alessi, these two authors fleshed out his original four concepts, creating the science fiction war comic Sigil, the magical fantasy adventure comic Mystic, the medieval high-tech Scion, and the fantasy drama of Meridian. One of the best reasons to check out CrossGen's first five comics wasn't just their beautiful artwork, and CrossGen had some of the top-of-the-line best computer technology in the American comic book industry at the time to make sure that their books stood out and looked gorgeous on a spinner rack, and they looked good enough to draw me in and get me flipping through their comics. But no, the thing that really kind of sold me on the idea was that their books came with a money-back guarantee. If a customer bought CrossGen Chronicles, plus the first three issues of any one of their titles, so for this particular series, let's say you bought Meridian 1 through 3 and CrossGen Chronicles issue 1, and for some reason you didn't like them, you could send them back to CrossGen for a full refund. No comic company did that. I mean, hell, most comic book stores don't accept returns. Even if your book's, like, damaged. A comic publisher doing this? Are you insane? To be fair, you did have to include a handwritten explanation about why you didn't like their books. So, I mean, they were getting some market research out of it as well. But, you know, hey, that's not that terrible of a thing to do. And you can get your... <laughs> Jeez, at the time it would have been, what, like... $12 back, I think, maybe, which ain't bad. Standing in that comic store, staring at the gorgeous covers of these comics, I was quickly falling in love. That particular comic store had, I believe it was like the first three issues of Mystic and Sigil, the first two of Scion, and I think maybe one of Meridian. 
Zion was the first book that like really caught my eye. This was the book that I was like, I think I'm going to buy this someday because its art style was clearly the most influenced by manga and animation. And that's honestly part of the reason why I first chose to cover it on the podcast. And it also featured artwork by Jim Chung, who I didn't know it at the time, but I recognized his work from Marvel's Maverick, another book that we've covered here on the show. I really hesitated to pick up the first several issues of Mystic, though, because the lead character, Giselle, is kind of your buxom comic book babe in a skimpy outfit. And I've always been super shy about bringing that kind of book up to a counter, especially three issues with this woman who looks, I mean, she's more covered than most, but I still hesitated to try Mystic out. So instead, I bought the first three issues of Sigil and I read them. Sure enough, I floop and loved them. Easily. Soon, I would go back to Comic Book City to pick up my monthly Uncanny X-Men issue, and I would ask the owner, Mr. Ray, if he planned to carry any of the cross-gen books. And he said no, not really wanting to risk his money on a company that he'd never heard of before that was probably going to fail really quickly. But he did tell me that he could order them for me, and he could hold them for me. Oh. I didn't even know that was a thing you could do. But thank you, yes please, give me them all. CrossGen would eventually go on to publish 17 ongoing series, a handful of miniseries, a few one-shots, multiple trade paperbacks, an art book, two statues, and I would buy as much of it as I was physically able to. There was no crossover to ever boost sales, there was no variant covers to boost sales, just solid, entertaining stories and beautiful artwork. In 2003, CrossGen evolved into CrossGen Entertainment in order to better reflect the aims of the company and the hopes of getting some of that Hollywood movie money. CrossGen also began publishing licensed titles like The Snake Pliskin Chronicles and R.A. Salvatore's Demon Wars. They created their own imprint as well, called Code 6, which was meant to be for creator-owned books like The Red Star and The Crossovers. Code 6 was essentially CrossGen's own in-house image comics. Seeing the potential in what would eventually become the digital comic book marketplace, CrossGen also pioneered a program called Comics on the Web, or COW, which readers could subscribe to. This was something that Marvel and DC wouldn't try to do for a number of years after the death of CrossGen. The company also released comics on DVD, and that is exactly what it sounds like. Each comic panel looked exactly like the panel from the comics. They literally just took their digital files and then animated them very slightly with word balloons, which would fade in and out as each character spoke. These DVDs did feature voice acting somewhere between like a flash cartoon and a still image in terms of what you're looking at. You can actually find a lot of them on YouTube if you are interested in that kind of thing. CrossGen was ahead of the times when it came to getting its comics in as many hands and hearts as possible, which doesn't really sound like an amazing thing that you should love a company for, right? But honestly, how hard do Marvel or DC work to get their books in the hands of new readers? There's never any kind of publication push, there's never any kind of indication or innovation in the American comic book industry to appeal to people somewhere other than a comic store. It's just the same thing over and over again by our next crossover. And I say that as a very small complaint because I will buy that next crossover, but there are people out there who would buy comics if they had a better way to get access to them or an easier way to get access to them. And CrossGen was focused on making that something they could do. The company wasn't just trying to change how readers interacted with their books either. Some of the most daring risks that CrossGen took in terms of an industry standard actually happened behind the scenes. For most of comic book history, even to this day, a company would hire its creative teams as freelancers, and they would work, you know, wherever they physically worked. At home, at a studio they rented, out of a shoebox, whatever they wanted. The creative team would then send their work to the publisher, formerly through the mail or postal services, and nowadays through email and file sharing. But 
at the time, if you were going to work for CrossGen, then you had to work physically at CrossGen Comics in Tampa, Florida. For most of its employees, this meant moving across the country and, for some, into the country for the first time. And while this particular story isn't true in every case, if it helped his company get the best people, Alessi would sometimes pay for the moving costs of team members. Throughout CrossGen's existence, Alessi would host parties for the staff, sponsor sport outings, and even cover medical bills in a few rare, necessary cases, and he would pay for all of this out of pocket. But on top of that, one of the amazing things that Crossan offered as a company was medical and dental insurance, a huge change for these creators from working at Marvel or DC. Crossan also provided bi-weekly paychecks, another change from submitting a work voucher to Marvel or DC and then waiting for the pay cycle to dole out the money. All cross-gen employees also qualified for profit sharing from all affiliated revenue streams, meaning things, you know, like video games, TV shows, movies, which unfortunately never happened, but had it happened, that would have been fantastic for all of them, as well as equity stakes in the company. And again, this didn't work out, but that's still pretty amazing. These are like the big important things that the creative teams and employees for cross-gen could use to build their lives. And it's why Crossgen was able to win over so many big talents from all of the bigger, more established comic book companies. The change to a working studio environment was certainly a big one for many of Crossgen staff, especially those who had worked in the comics industry for a while. The hard structure of a 9-to-5 job isn't exactly conducive to the creative process. As a writer or an artist, you, you feel it when you feel it, right? You do still have to sit down and do the work, but it's easier to do the work when you're feeling like you want to do the work, as opposed to clocking in at 9 in the morning going, I didn't used to get up till 11. Ugh. Long timers were used to sitting at home, wearing their comfortable house clothes. Uh, author Mark Wade would joke that he used to write scripts sitting in his Superman bathrobe before coming to CrossGen. But many creators did enjoy the camaraderie that such an environment allowed. Again, a lot of them were used to working from home, and they just went to working next to some of the most amazing talent in the industry. If you were an artist stuck on a page, you could take a break, walk around the building, you know, chat with another artist, maybe check out their new pages for inspiration, or talk to your author if you were confused about a particular scene or had a story idea you wanted to pitch. Another writer could talk over plot details or conceptual problems with another author in real time, or look at the artwork for the issue that they wrote last month, inspiring them to do more and push the envelope in their stories. Many of the former CrossGen employees have stated that one of the best parts of the job for them was working with everyone else. A handful of them would either go comic shopping together on New Comic Day, Wednesday, cleaning out the local shops for the newest books, which, I mean, that is a sacred act for us comic fans, so I love the fact that they got to share that with each other, and then they could gush over what books they were buying. CrossGen also provided in-building showers for the creative teams in case they wanted to refresh after sitting in their chairs all day, or if they felt like staying overnight. Uh, it had a cafeteria staffed with food and drinks that were free for the employees, Reports online seem to indicate that these were not like, you know, steaks or filet mignon. It was here's chips and Gatorade kind of thing, which is still better than nothing. But I mean, I get it. It's not great. Uh, and it did also have a game room in case you needed to take a moment to unwind, which is, man, I just feel like that's a bad idea to put in a bunch of comic people's general vicinity. It also stalked a ghost that haunted the building, although that was really more of a bug than a feature. But several Crossgen employees did have chilling encounters or strange things happen to them when they were working late nights. Despite Crossgen's publication growth and the promise that it brought to the industry, in 2003, things were beginning to look grim. Despite its product expansion and the awards that they had won since they first opened, Crossgen had not yet turned a profit. This was something that Alessi had accounted for. He had enough money that he had planned for CrossGen to lose money up to the first six years of publication. 
But he was also counting on movie and TV deals coming in to save it at some point, and that just had not happened. Rumors of film adaptations flew fast and often around the various properties, but they just never manifested. Rumors started going around the internet that some of the creators hadn't been paid for their work, sometimes for weeks, sometimes in months, and soon enough, news started to come out that various creators were leaving the company. All of the promise that Crosschen had was burning up like morning mist. In 2003, Crosschen eventually declared bankruptcy. Alessi, a lifelong collector of original comic art, sold quite a bit of his collection in order to either pay back the creators that the company was unable to pay, or to lend money to Crossgen as a company in order to fight a buyout. But unfortunately, it was just never enough. In 2004, Crossgen's assets were purchased by Disney Publishing, and Disney basically locked them away. Until... 2006. A company called Checker Books licensed the publishing rights to the CrossGen library. They picked up publishing the trade paperbacks where CrossGen had been forced to stop. They published a few more collected materials, but they did not publish anything new in 2008. Now, wait a minute, you might be thinking to yourself, Disney is the company that owns the rights to CrossGen, yes. And didn't Disney buy Marvel Comics back in 2009? Don't they own a comic book publisher? Couldn't they have Marvel publish CrossGen Comics and maybe even bring them back, publish new material? Well, somebody else had that idea, and Marvel tried. They did publish three miniseries. Two of them, Sigil and Mystic, were absolutely and utterly unlike their source material, inspired by their source material, but featuring few to little connections otherwise. The third comic, Ruse, was basically Ruse, minus any of the cross-gen universe elements that would have been there, but featuring the same characters, the same author, and basically the same creative team. And it's, it's honestly a pretty good miniseries. Sales of these comics ultimately were unimpressive, though, and Marvel never moved forward with any other original material. They did plan for a Route 666 horror comic revival, but like I said, other than some finished cover sketch artwork online, we've never seen anything else about this book. As much as I love CrossGen, you know, I'm honestly okay with Marvel not publishing new material. I've gotten to watch Marvel try to resurrect dead publishing lines, long-canceled titles, or failed concepts pretty much all of my comic buying life, and they almost always completely suck. I can appreciate what CrossGen was and what it meant to me personally without modern attempts to, like, Frankenstein it back into life. Sometimes it's healthier for people to just accept death. Sometimes things don't work. Sometimes they fail, and you just have to move on with your life. Although I won't lie, it does hurt my soul to see their various titles and dollar bins these days. But maybe that means some other kid on a budget is going to discover them and, you know, love them too. You gotta stay hopeful for that kind of thing. I still root through dollar bins looking for cheap comics that I can fall in love with. And if somebody else gets to do that with CrossGen, so much the better. I actually think that CrossGen's death is one of the reasons why I still love it so deeply. With Marvel or DC, most of their concepts have been being published since the 1960s, some of them as far back as the 1940s, and so both companies have been forced to grow and change with the times. That means having multiple writers, artists, and even interpretations of their individual characters. And while I do think that is one of the strengths of the American comic book industry, the ability to take a solid idea like the Hulk or Spider-Man or Batman and constantly update it for whatever that character can mean today, that's pretty great. But I also think it's one of the industry's greatest overall weaknesses, too. Because if you, as a fan, do not like an author or an artist or a particular era of a comic book, then you just might stop buying that title completely, which certainly doesn't help the industry. But with CrossGen, I mean, the company only lasted for four years, 
and it died just as their first big status quo changing story was just starting. I only get to remember the good times about CrossGen because CrossGen never lived long enough for things to get bad from a storytelling perspective. In terms of presentation, one of my favorite things about CrossGen was their website. And God, who says that they love a company's website ever? They had this cute navigation system where you were looking into the galaxy that represented the cross-gen universe, right? And each planet in that galaxy was a planet in the comics. And by clicking on it, it would take you to information about that book, like the creative team and the cast. And they had release dates for each book, which was updated monthly on time. Something that Marvel certainly never did. Hell, I don't think that's something Marvel even does now. Timeliness for its publishing line was something that Mark Alessi was particularly proud of in regards to CrossGen. I believe at the time of CrossGen's birth, uh, Marvel's The Ultimates was one of the most well-reviewed comics at the time, but it was so frequently late that as far as I'm concerned, they might still be publishing issues of it today. I don't know. If I remember correctly, CrossGen never missed a ship day. The only time that they were late, and I do think there were two times that their books were shipped late, but they were published on time, was because the company who printed their books failed to print them and ship them out on time. So there's only so much CrossGen can do on that end of things. CrossGen ultimately did everything that it could to produce the best quality product that it could on time while appealing to as wide a fan base as possible, using top-of-the-line technology while attempting to take care of its employees. And it simply wasn't successful for a variety of reasons. But for me, I discovered some of my favorite writers and artists during its lifespan, as well as a whole host of characters and stories to love for hopefully the rest of my life. Now, I am painting this picture with rose-colored glasses of love, but I want to be clear. While Mark Alessi founded CrossGen and it was definitely shaped to his vision for what he wanted it to be, that doesn't mean that the man was a saint. Interviews with authors after the fact would reveal that Alessi was very strongly opinionated, and as the founder of the company and the money behind it, he expected to be listened to. He was a boss with a capital B. Authors Mark Wade and Ron Mars have been very open about their arguments and confrontations with Alessi and how verbally abusive he could be. The bankruptcy was also very damaging to the staff, nearly ruining some people. Mars himself said that he was, quote, left holding the bag for about $4,000, end quote, that he was simply never paid. Alessi did an interview with the Dollar Bin podcast in 2016, and listening to that interview, he does seem like a very uh, no-nonsense, confident, possibly arrogant man. I can believe that those encounters that Mars, Wade, and other creators had with Alessi happened. I can believe that. Alessi also has his own complaints with some of his detractors, to be fair, so the problems might go both ways. Kind of take everybody with a grain of salt and assume that they're all people. People have conflicts, and they do their best to work through them, and sometimes it does, and sometimes they don't. In a cross-gen special released by Wizard Magazine, Mark Wade stated that the art teams would often work 60 hours a week, if not more. And this isn't terribly uncommon in the comic book industry. You know, a, a comic page takes as long as a comic page takes. That's why artists get paid by the page, not by the hour. But I just want to make it clear that as much as I love CrossGen, as much as I am a fan of what they did and what they attempted to do, it was not a paradise and it was not some kind of utopian dream company. I love CrossGen and I will always love it. But I am also willing to admit that it wasn't perfect for anybody who worked there or honestly consume their media. And as long as we're talking about the bad vibes of the company, uh, Mark Alessi died in 2019 of a massive coronary arrest. His cousin and co-founder, Gina M. Villa, died back in December of 2022. I could not find a cause online. 
since Breakdown's initial examination of Scion, Marvel Comics have poked around with Cross-Gen's library a little bit more. In 2022, Marvel published a one-shot called Cross-Gen Tales that simply reprinted the first issues of Ruse, Sigil, Mystic, and Sojourn, with a honestly pretty good-looking new cover by artist Paco Medina. This past December, in 2023, Marvel also published a hardcover omnibus for Sigil, collecting all 42 issues, the two-issue Saurians miniseries, a Sigil-specifically related issue of Cross-Gen Chronicles, and Sigil-related material from another issue, but not the entire issue. Plus, it's got a bunch of interviews that were originally published in the individual issues of the comics, uh, or in the trade paperbacks. They are trade-specific, and it's really nice that they included those, because you don't normally see that kind of material collected in an omnibus. The book also features the script for issue 43, which was never produced or published. A similar release is planned for Mystic later this year, and I hope that Marvel has the balls and the financial incentive to keep this cross-gen train rolling. I don't need new material, but if you want to publish and clean up the old material and represent it to me, I'll, I'll pay for it again. The omnibuses are expensive as hell, uh, at about $125 each retail, but they're gorgeous, and they are worth it if you don't want to collect the individual issues. And I mean, honestly, you can get the individual issues for about a dollar each if you're going to go hunting for them anyways. My best guess is that Sigil and Mystic are kind of like test releases for the company, and if they sell well enough, then we might see more after that. It is interesting to me, now that I'm looking at it, that Crossgen has only republished material or created new series related to the comics Sigil, Mystic, and Ruse. That's weird. Sojourn's inclusion in the Crossgen Tales one-shot is the only other Crossgen comic to ever get reprinted or played with at all, and I wonder why that is. Like, Ruse, Sojourn, and the pirate comic El Cazador were perhaps Crossgen's most famous books by the end of its life, and some of the most well-received by its fans, so why not start with those heavy hitters? Plus, El Cazador only ran for like six issues, and then it had a one-shot that was published. That's basically the length of a trade paperback. You could spit that out relatively easy and be collecting 20, 30 bucks, no problem. I don't know. We may never know what's going on behind the scenes with Marvel in regards to cross-gen, or what kind of legal things and hoops they might have to jump through in order to, uh, publish these materials, but... Hopefully, Marvel will keep bringing the reprints, and we can uh, experience cross-gen moving into the future, over and over again. Much like Scion, Meridian is fairly standalone in its story. We will be covering the main series, all 44 issues of it, plus a single issue of Cross-Gen Chronicles. We'll see our two sigil bearers, Sefi and Elan, explore their newfound powers in incredibly different ways, demonstrating some of the creative breadth of the cross-gen universe. We're going to get to explore a planet with floating islands and skyships and pirates. Family will betray family. Sefi will become one of those sky pirates eventually. Uh, she'll fall in love. She'll make new friends, fight for her freedom, fight for her life, and ultimately prepare for a war. One that she never saw coming. Join me in a week for episode 32.1 of Comic Book Breakdown, Meridian, Family Matters. If you enjoyed this episode of Breakdown, please make sure to hit that like button. And if you are not subscribed to the show, then click on that as well. I love getting feedback and I would really appreciate it if you did so. If you have any questions, concerns, or would like to suggest a comic or a series to me, Breakdown can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and on a variety of podcast platforms with links in the description for this episode below, as well as the email cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>